Our next speaker is Katie Mack. She's a theoretical astrophysicist who studies a range of questions in cosmology, the study of the universe from beginning to end. She is assistant professor of physics at North Carolina State University, where she's also a member of the leadership in public science cluster, and is currently visiting Perimeter Institute as a Simons Emmy Nota Fellow. Throughout her career, Katie has studied dark matter, the early universe, galaxy formation, black holes, cosmic strings, and the ultimate fate of the cosmos. Alongside her academic research, she is an active science communicator, both in traditional publications and social media, as Astro Katie. Her book, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, comes out in June. Please join me in welcoming Katie Mack. All right, well, it's great to be here. Um, thank you all for getting up so early in the morning and, and coming out here to hear us talk about careers in science. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, how I got into theoretical physics, um, how, uh, how I started thinking about astrophysics and the cosmos and the connections between studying the cosmos and studying sort of the fundamental nature of physics. So uh, there, are, there are all these really deep connections between what we see out there in the universe and the way that physics works on the smallest scales in the sort of deepest sense. So I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, I study things out there in the sky. Um, this is a photo from, uh, from Australia, uh, where you can, you can see the center of the galaxy, actually, in the, in the, in the, sort of somewhere in there. Um, uh, but uh, this is not how I got into uh, studying astronomy. Uh, I grew up here. Uh, in Los Angeles, and that's the color of the sky in Los Angeles. You do not see the cosmos in Los Angeles. You see stars of a different type, um, but not, not that type. So the thing that got me into, into astronomy, into physics, was really just wanting to understand how everything works. This is a photo of me when I was a little kid. Uh, that's, that's me there. Uh, fixing some, some neighborhood kid's bike. Um, I was the kind of person who would take apart the remote control, and I just wanted to understand how, uh, how it all fit together, like what made things work, what are the sort of fundamental ideas behind uh, things around me, everything I could find around me. And by the time I was in middle school, I was a very geeky little kid uh, doing my homework uh, before school with my little calculator out. Um, but this was all part of uh, just really trying to understand things. And, and as I got older, I would start to read up on more and more advanced concepts. So I, I was really into Discover Magazine uh, and thinking about, like, what about higher dimensions of space? What about, you know, how does mathematics fit together? How do you think about uh, time and things like that? And then I started reading books like this, A Brief History of Time. And I really loved the, uh, the sort of mind-bendy aspect of that, um, trying to wrap my head around things that were so far out of my experience. Um, and then when I was in high school, I got a very unique experience, uh, opportunity, which is I was able to do some uh, actual research um, at a physics facility in Japan. Uh, so this is the Super Kamiokande neutrino detector. Um, and I got to go there and uh, do very simple work, uh, sort of taking measurements of, of radon in the, in the cave. Uh, so this is a, a facility that's underneath a mountain in Japan. Um, that's a picture of me uh, uh, at, the, at the control room. So the reason I was able to go is that my, my high school was connected to a university, Cal State uh, Dominguez Hills, and so I was able to get in touch with the college professors and, and go and work at that experiment. Now, um, I was interested in you know, space and, and, and uh, time and, and geometry and things like that. Um, I had never done anything in, the, in experimental physics before, and the work that I did there was not um, particularly deep. You know, I was kind of babysitting the neutrino detector and making sure nothing went wrong. Uh, but I was able to learn more about particle physics and start to see the connections between particle physics 
and uh, the universe. Um, just to give you a little bit more idea of what it was like there, this is the entrance to the mine. Um, so the mine is, it's, the detector is underneath a mountain to shield from cosmic rays. So you drive into the mountain uh, from, the, from the bottom and you go in a kilometer into this tunnel and then you sit in this control room uh, uh, and I was working the night shift, so I would get there at, at midnight and sit there all night uh, looking at these displays and watching neutrinos come into the detector and light up the little display um, and try and make sure nothing went wrong. Um, and every once in a while, because it was an active mine, every once in a while somebody would run in uh, and uh, wearing a hard hat and yell something in Japanese and then the building would start to shake uh, <laughs> because they were blasting. <laughs> because they were getting more zinc out of the mine. It was an exciting time. Um, <laughs> but one, one thing I learned about neutrinos was uh, that neutrinos are these little particles that come from the sun, and, um, and they, can travel through, they could travel through the whole Earth and not care. They could travel through a light year of lead and only have a 5% chance of interacting with anything. But we can detect them in machines like this. And if, and if we do that, we can actually make an image of the sun in neutrinos. This is an image of the sun in neutrinos. Now, half of the neutrinos in this image are, uh, were, half of them were seen at night, right? So these are, some of them are coming right through the Earth, all the way through the planet, not even noticing. Uh, some of them are coming through uh, in the other direction. And you can build up an, an, an image of our sun because our sun is, is producing those neutrinos. And that was one of the first ways that I saw the connections between space and the subatomic world. Uh, you know, what's happening out there in the universe and what's happening uh, on scales so small that we, we can barely even detect them, even if we build a 40-meter tall, 40-meter wide cylindrical detector with all of these, these uh, tubes and water and everything and trying to, to detect these tiny things. Um, so then after, after high school, I got into college, and I started to really study uh, the cosmos uh, itself, and I started to do research on uh, the epoch when the first stars and galaxies were formed in the universe, and started to learn about how galaxies come about um, and what it is that governs the, the evolution of the cosmos. Um, when we look at images like this, so this is an image of a cluster of galaxies, uh, we're looking at galaxies that are, that are in the very distant past. Some of the, the, some of the little splotches on this picture, you know, sort of in the background, um, are, are galaxies that are so distant that when we see them, we're seeing light that left those galaxies billions and billions of years ago. And so as we look out into the cosmos, we're really looking back in time. Um, here's just an il illustration of that. If you're looking at uh, a deep field image from the Hubble Space Telescope, you're looking back to a time when the universe was maybe only half a billion years old. And as you look farther and farther back, you can start to see light that's coming from some of the very first stars and galaxies in the universe. And one of the things that I was interested in in college was I was working on the question of, you know, what, what do we see if we can see those first stars and galaxies? What happens uh, in the time when the first stars and galaxies are forming? How does that work? And I started to get interested in, in other questions about how do even those things come about? Like, what happens if you look if you look so far away that you're looking so far back that it's the time before stars and galaxies are forming? What about when you look so far back that you're seeing closer and closer to the Big Bang itself? Because we know that the universe started from this very dense, hot state called the, the Big Bang, the hot Big Bang. And so if the universe was hot and dense everywhere uh, in the, at very early times, then we can look so far back, so far away, that we're looking back in time and we're looking to a part of the universe that from our perspective, the light from that part of the universe has left it so long ago that it's still on fire. It's still in that hot, dense state. And so we can actually see the Big Bang itself. We can, go at, we can look out and we can see light from parts of the universe that are still in that primordial fireball state. And when we do, we can map out the radiation from that time. And it's called the cosmic microwave background. This is a map of the afterglow of the Big Bang. This is a sort of projection of the whole sky. And in this, in this image, what you see is tiny, tiny fluctuations in temperature of that early fireball state of the cosmos, of the time when the whole cosmos was in this sort of churning, roiling, fiery plasma. Um, and we can look very carefully at these little fluctuations, these tiny little fluctuations in temperature um, in that early time fireball state, 
And we can see that there's little bits of the universe that were a little bit more dense and little bits of the universe that were a little bit less dense. And we can take that information, give it to a computer, and say, okay, let's say that we have matter and we make a little bit of it more dense, a little bit of it less dense, and then we turn on gravity and see what happens. And when you do that, the parts that are a little bit more dense come together and create these clusters and these filaments. And this is a computer simulation of what happens when you do that, what happens when you take the information from that very early state of the universe, put it into a computer, and just add gravity. And what we see is what's called a cosmic web, where on these kinds of scales, this would be like a cluster of galaxies. There'd be galaxies sprinkled along here, and then giant voids. And then we go out and look at, into the cosmos, and we map out where the galaxies are. We see the very same thing. We see these clusters of galaxies and these filaments and these giant voids. And what that shows us is that taking that information from the very early universe, plugging it into a computer and adding the physics that we understand of how gravity works and how matter works, um, we actually can get something that we see out in the sky. So we're really learning how to put together these ideas, how to put together uh, the physics of gravity, the, the, uh, our understanding of the very early universe, and how that's evolved over time to give this very beautiful, very complete picture of how we came to be, how everything we see in the sky came to be. And one of the things that we've learned from that is that everything, all of this, is underlined by a new kind of matter that we've never been able to detect, even in the largest particle detectors under the mountains, uh, which is called dark matter. So when I showed this beautiful simulation, what I didn't tell you is that every little particle in this simulation um, is a particle who, that only does gravity. It only has gravity, has mass, but it doesn't do any of the other forces of nature. It's a new kind of matter that you put into these simulations that just, just purely gravitates, doesn't have electromagnetic interactions, doesn't have pressure. It's something called dark matter. And when you do these simulations with just, just dark matter, you do get the right distribution of matter, which tells us that there's got to be stuff out there that we can't see. There's got to be extra matter out there that's surrounding every galaxy in the universe that's, that's really the basis of all the structure in the cosmos, but it's a new kind of matter that we can't see. We only see its gravitational effects. And what we think is that it's sort of surrounding galaxies and clusters of galaxies in these clumps. And we're now able to do something where we can actually map where that is. So this is an image of a couple of clusters of galaxies and when we map out where the gravity is in these clusters of galaxies, we see that there's got to be all this invisible stuff that's sort of gathered around these clusters of galaxies. And this is dark matter. And dark matter is one of the most important things in the universe. It's most of the matter in the universe, something like 85%, such that if you do these simulations where you have only dark matter in your simulations, then you kind of sprinkle galaxies on top at the end, you get the right answer. So it's got to be the thing that's driving the evolution of the cosmos. And that's the thing that I'm really studying, like what is this weird, uh, mysterious stuff? And there's another connection between that and sort of particle physics, which is that what we think is that this dark matter, this invisible stuff that's most of the matter in the universe, that's collected around every galaxy in the universe, we think that this stuff is some new kind of particle, some new kind of particle that doesn't interact with electromagnetism that would pass right through you if it, if it hit you, that's probably passing right through you in this room right now, um, but that has gravity and, and has these weird properties. And it's something outside of our current understanding of particle physics. And so we have a number of different ways to look for dark matter. Um, there, are, there are big uh, experiments underground. Um, there are attempts to find its effects in space. One of the things that I'm working on myself is trying to understand how it might have affected the first stars and galaxies. So going back to that picture of the, uh, the very beginning of structure in the cosmos, what happened at the very beginning, how the first stars and galaxies formed, I'm interested in how dark matter might have affected those things. Um, and I just want to uh, show one more picture of one way that we're looking for dark matter, which is this. This is a uh, an instrument on the International Space Station called the, uh, called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, the AMS. Uh, this thing here, it's a sort of little box that's hanging off the edge of the International Space Station, and it's a cosmic ray detector, so it's detecting um, particles from space, uh, and it's hoping to find some signature of dark matter particles 
doing, uh, doing self-annihilation. So there's this idea that maybe if a dark matter particle meets another dark matter particle in just the right way, they'll annihilate with each other and create some kind of particles that we can see. This is sort of our hope. This is something that would make it a lot easier to, to figure out what it is. And so this, this particle detector is looking for that. Um, and so far, what this particle detector has found has been a lot of really interesting, uh, weird results. So they've seen that there are way, there's way more antimatter in the universe than we expected, basically. Uh, a lot of really high energy particles of uh, antimatter, antiprotons and positrons, which are antimatter particles of electrons. Um, and there's a chance that dark matter is the thing that's, that's doing that, that's, that's causing that, uh, that uh, imbalance, that there's that, that extra dark, that extra antimatter. Um, but there's also a chance that it's something else. So when I've been uh, working on dark matter and trying to understand what dark matter is, you know, I've been very excited about the results from this experiment, um, but I've also been acknowledging that there's, it's quite possible that what this experiment is seeing is other kinds of astrophysics. So there's a chance that all the positrons it's seeing are from pulsars, which are kind of highly energetic spinning neutron star that creates jets of particles that shoot out from the poles and, um, and do these, and, and create these sort of amazing um, pulses of, of radiation. And they also find a lot of antiprotons, and there's a chance that the antiprotons come from supernova remnants, from the explosions of, uh, of massive stars, uh, creating uh, all these uh, charged particles as, the, as the, uh, the remnants of the debris from the star expands. Um, and so I think it's fascinating how even, you know, looking for, for this stuff that's the, the most of the matter in the universe, that's underlying all the structure in the universe, uh, can tell us something maybe about the physics of the, of the very smallest particles, maybe about um, supermassive stars exploding, maybe about these highly energetic spinning uh, remnants of stars called neutron stars. There's so many things that we learn about the cosmos when we're trying to understand something about particle physics and vice versa. Um, so this is something that's, that I think is very exciting and, and I just wanted to sort of emphasize those connections between um, what you learn when you're trying to look at the smallest things and what you learn when you're trying to look at the largest things and how, you know, just because uh, you have an interest in, in one sort of area of science, you might learn about other areas, you might be sort of take some kind of meandering path and find something that's really, really fascinating that is, it seems to be a sort of polar opposite but actually is all part of the same thing. So I think I'll stop there um, and I will take any questions. Thank you. Just as someone's coming up, we actually had some questions from oh. our online audience from okay. uh, Gloucester High School in Ottawa. We had okay. some questions from them, so maybe we'll just start with one of theirs. Um, they had a question about black holes. Okay. If black holes trap all light and can't be seen, how mm. do we know they're there? Right. Uh, so one of the ways that we know black holes are there is sort of similar to one of the ways that we know that dark matter is there is that um, they have strong effects on the stuff around them that does emit light. So with, with dark matter, we know it's there because it affects the way that stars and galaxies move around. With black holes, the ones that we know about, there are a couple of ways we know about them, but one of the ways we know about black holes is if a black hole has matter falling into it and it makes a sort of whirlpool um, as the matter is falling in, and because of these, this extremely strong gravity, it sort of you know, uh, has it's sort of the matter sort of crashing together and get, and it's like a, a, there's a really strong whirlpool, there's all this friction, and so that makes the matter heat up and start glowing. And so a lot of times we see black holes because we see a strong X-ray source. Uh, so there's stuff that's so hot that it's glowing in X-rays, you know, so like when something's really hot, we think of it glowing red or glowing blue if it's really, really hot. If it's glowing extremely hot, it glows in X-rays. And so we see this X-ray light uh, coming from very distant objects. And and that's one of the ways, that's the first way that we've found black holes in the universe. And there are a couple other ways we see them now. We can see them with gravitational waves when black holes crash into each other. We can see uh, things moving around black holes uh, in very close orbits in the center of the galaxy. We see our supermassive black hole that way. Um, but mostly it's because when stuff falls into a black hole, it doesn't fall straight in. It swirls around and, and heats up and we see that light. Hi. When you have a question, when you when you have a question about astrophysics, how do you research the question? What kind of resources do you use? Uh, yeah, so 
there are a lot of, it depends on what kind of question it is. Um, so, I mean, for, for me, uh, so, you know, because I've, I've gone through undergraduate and PhD in astrophysics, like I, um, I have a lot of resources in terms of textbooks and in terms of, of notes from classes and stuff like that. Um, but uh, generally the first thing I do is I look at papers that have been published by other researchers and I see if people have uh, looked at that question or just, uh, you know, a lot of things, there's a lot of information just out there on the internet. So if, I, if I'm moving into a new field, like let's say I wanted to know something about uh, red giant stars, you know, and that's not my specialty. I study um, cosmology and, and other things, but if I wanted to know something about red giants, I mean, first I'd go to like, Wikipedia, and then I'd go to some university pages that have uh, pages by, by researchers who are specifically looking at that, and then I'd look at the, um, the literature in terms of uh, the, uh, in terms of published papers. But if there's a question, a sort of research question, then the, the best thing that, that I can do is, is talk to people who work on that question. So I have colleagues around the world who I've gotten in touch with through conferences and, and being you know, at the same universities and stuff. And so I can always figure out like, oh, you know, I know this person works on massive stars. Maybe they have uh, somebody I can talk to to, uh, to direct me to the best resource on that. So one of the things that I think is not always understood about theoretical physics is that it's really, really collaborative. Like, almost, we, know, we almost never work alone. Um, you know, just wandering around the halls here, uh, you, you're constantly running into people, into groups of people, you know, standing next to blackboards, writing equations, talking to each other. Um, almost nobody is sort of isolated. Uh, and so it's always about, you know, we, we each have our little areas that we work on, but then we talk to each other and we share ideas and we try and come up with new creative ways to answer questions. I uh, have another question. What's the meaning of giant, sorry, what's the meaning of voids you talked about? The, sorry? The voids. Voids? Oh, uh, oh, giant voids. Uh, so I was talking about, um, I was talking about uh, these, uh, you know, big sort of empty spaces um, between galaxies. So there are some parts of the universe where there are fewer galaxies than other parts, and we just call those voids. But um, it's not, uh, I mean, you can see them as well in, in uh, you know, developing in this, in this simulation where p places where there's very little matter to begin with, that matter flows toward the more high-density places, and so the, those spaces sort of empty out. So it's, not empty. it's not completely empty, no. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hi, Hi, my name's Emily. Um, you were talking about dark matter a lot. Yes. Is that similar to dark energy? Ah, good question. Uh, dark matter and dark energy. Um, so they have very little in common in the sense of they act in very different ways. They're both called dark because we don't understand them and we don't know what they are, uh, basically. <laughs> uh, and they're invisible. Both of them are invisible. But dark matter is a kind of matter, so it's something that has gravity that pulls other matter toward it. Dark energy is something that kind of does the opposite. It stretches space out. So um, when Einstein talked about gravity, he talked about the shape of space. So uh, something that's massive is kind of pulling space toward it and making like a dent in space or a sort of concentration of space. Um, and dark energy is something that stretches space out. So it makes, uh, it makes our universe expand faster and faster. So in 1998, astronomers discovered that the universe is expanding faster than it used to be, which is weird. Um, we thought that it would be slowing down in its expansion since the Big Bang, and it turns out as of five billion years ago, it's speeding up. Um, and there's nothing uh, in sort of our standard understanding of physics that would allow that to happen. So we had to come up with something called dark energy, which would be something that would make space expand faster. So it just kind of stretches space. Um, and we don't know what it is. We think it's probably something called a cosmological constant, which is kind of just a property of space that makes it want to expand more. Um, but uh, we call it dark energy because we're, we're not really sure, and we can't see it. Um, what sort of obstacles have you faced like through your career path? Uh, obstacles. Um, I mean, so there are a couple of things that are hard about um, about academia and and physics in particular. Um, I mean, w one of them is just that it's it's a lot of hard work. Uh, so I didn't get very much sleep in, in college, um, and uh, you know it's it's hard to work when you're not sleeping, um, and. Uh, and also, as an academic, you tend to move around a lot. It's hard to be kind of, um, uh, you know, 
grounded in one place or another, and so uh, you end up, like for me, I've, I've moved to different countries at kind of every stage of my career, um, and so I've had to sort of make new friends and, and kind of do a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of rebuilding uh, my life up and stuff like that. So, so to me, like, a lot of that kind of personal side of things has been um, has been difficult. Now, not everybody does that. A lot of people stay in the same country their whole career, or sometimes some people are even lucky enough to stay in the same kind of region. But uh, for a lot of people, academia involves a lot of kind of moving and, and being flexible about your lifestyle. And so that's that's been uh, difficult, but also you know very exciting in, in a lot of ways. So it, it just it varies, but mostly it's just uh, you know there's, it's a lot of hard work and. Um, for me, it's worth it because I really enjoy the work. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not hard. Like, I think one of the things that one misconception that people have is that if you're if you're somebody who should be a physicist, it should just come easy to you. And um, and so if it doesn't come easy to you, then you shouldn't be a physicist. And that's ridiculous. Like, it's hard, you know. <laughs> and it's okay if it's hard. It's okay if like when you start a new field, you're struggling because that's that's how it goes, you know. Like you start something new, you struggle, and and then you get better at it as you practice. And so that's that's something that I always try and tell people. Like, don't be afraid of having to work hard. That doesn't mean you're not good or not a natural or whatever. Thank you. Thanks. We'll take one more question. Um, for those of you in the line, Katie is going to be here during the, the um, speed mentoring session, so hopefully you can ask her one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. My name is Alina, and I was wondering, if you reach the edge of the universe, what would like past the edge of the universe look like? Right, so, so as far as we know, there's no edge of the universe. So in this kind of image, what we're showing is the edge of how far we can see, and the reason that there's an edge to how far we can see is because if we look too far away, we're looking so far away that the light that from that point has taken the whole age of the universe to get to us. And so you can imagine, um, you know, you can imagine there's something beyond that distance where the light would take more than the age of the universe to get to you. So, like, let's, so the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So imagine there's something so far away that the light would take 15 billion years to cover that distance. Um, it hasn't got here yet, right? Like, so, so we can't see the light from that distance because it would take longer than the, universe to, than the age of the universe to get here. So there's a, certain, there's a clear edge to our observable universe. Um, but in terms of the actual like, cosmos, uh, we don't see any evidence for an edge. We don't see any evidence for a center or an edge. There's just like, there's where we are and we have some view from here. And that view from here has a, has a sort of hard wall where we can't see beyond that. But as far as we can tell, the universe is basically the same everywhere. And um, you know, if you look on the large enough scales, like you can't see any indication that it'll that it's more, you know, that it ha that it's going toward something different in, in one direction or another. So there doesn't seem to be an edge. There doesn't seem to be a center. There's just sort of our perspective and how that changes because of how long it takes light to travel. Does that help? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you.